Andrew Stewart, who's a Melbourne-based Linux enthusiast. He first booted, he first, sorry, he booted the first ROMP kernel on Amazon EC2. He's a Python pro programmer. He's a contributor to Mailman Project and a recent convert to React.js and JavaScript, just like myself. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for coming along. Um, so I guess just a few things to say. The first is that uh, public speaking makes me edgy, so uh, that may come across. Um, uh, and, and as part of that, I, I was here for a the previous presentation in here by a fabulous speaker who um, she got up here and spoke confidently uh, and articulately with barely looking at her notes the whole time, and that's not going to happen this time. I'm essentially going to be reading from the notes. I'm a lot more confident to read what I've written than to wing it. Um, uh, and also, thanks for coming. I, I, I spoke at um, the Python conference in, in Brisbane last year, and, and the topic that I chose was a, a fairly uh, obscure and arcane one. And uh, to my disappointment, uh, not, not that many people actually turned up. And uh, so I thought, well, this time, hopefully I've chosen a topic that's of interest to people. And judging by the number of people, uh, 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 I think I've done that. And it appears that unikernels are kind of on the way up in, in terms of their level of interest that the community has with them. And I'm guessing that's why uh, a lot of you are here. Um, the other thing is that uh, I, I have no idea what the timing of this is. It may be a very short presentation. If it is, hopefully it was interesting. Um, uh, or it may be approximately to the time that we're talking about. Uh, we'll just see how it goes and we'll have questions at the end. If you've got a question along the way, you're welcome to ask it as well. You can, you can interrupt, I don't mind. Um, oh yeah, we need to make sure you've got the microphone if you do have a question. And I need to repeat the question, I presume. Um, okay, so starting with the, the title of, of my talk, the, the future belongs to unikernels. Um, since I signed up to speak at this conference, I, I've reread the title a few times and, and, I've, and I've cringed a bit because it was kind of clickbaity. That's the first bit of the title, but the, the full title is that Linux will soon no longer be used in internet-facing production systems. Now, that, that may be a bit of a stretch, perhaps, but <laughs> I, was, I, I wasn't really able to go back and change it, so... So I've, I've run with it, and I felt obliged to put it up here as well. But look, there, there is perhaps a grain of truth in it. So, so maybe my objective here anyway is to put an argument to you that maybe there's a grain of truth in it. So that's my goal, is to try to convince you that uh, unikernels are the safest way to deploy services to the internet. And in the future, directly connecting machines, uh, Linux machines, or more accurately, uh, any operating system uh, with a user login system, be it uh, Linux or FreeBSD or OpenBSD, uh, will generally be seen as risky and insecure, and your boss may call you into the office and ask you to explain should you connect a, a, a machine to the internet that has a user sign-in system. Um, okay, so what, I'll, what I'm going to present here today uh, we'll start with an overview of what a, uh, a unikernel is, um, and I'll give a quick rundown on the, the state of the art in unikernels in 2016, uh, and we'll run through some uh, common security problems and how unikernels can help, and uh, finally a chance for audience questions. And I, I, get, I guess to explain my, my interest and knowledge that I have of uh, unikernels has come from primarily, um, I, I just took an interest in it uh, early last year and, and got involved with the, the Rump Kernel uh, project, really mainly trying to get it working in the cloud computing environment. Um, uh, the, the Rump, uh, these kernels are coming a long way in terms of their technology, but it's not all there yet. Um, and doing things like trying to get them to run in uh, Amazon EC2 or the other cloud computing environments is still a really hairy configuration. Uh, process. So that's my background. I, I was doing some early stuff with the, the sort of lead developers there to, to try to get the kernel to work. So I, I claim no credit for doing anything of any significance except battling my way through days and weeks of painful configuration issues. Um,
and uh, yeah, finally, I'll talk about uh, security and hopefully how unikernels can help with that. Um, so what is a unikernel? Well, Wikipedia um, suggests that it's a specialised single address space machine images. Um, uh, and there's a number of ways that you can kind of think of them. One of the, uh, one of the analogies, um, or rather the complete Wikipedia quote is that unikernels are specialised single address space machine images constructed by using library operating systems. A developer selects from a modular stack a minimal set of libraries which corresponds to the OS constructs required for their application to run. Um, another analogy uh, is that a unikernel is, is somewhat similar to an old MS-DOS application. Um, and this is a very, you'll have to, you'll have to humour me on this one, but back in the days of DOS, you'd run your application and the application had owned the machine. Um, just one application would be running. Uh, there's no multitasking going on, certainly no separate user layer running underneath, uh, and there's nothing that can be logged into. Uh, the computer was doing one thing only, and that was running that application. Um, the BIOS provided uh, interrupts for disk and uh, keyboard access and spoke directly to the display mostly. Um, so the analogy probably doesn't stand up to close scrutiny, but it's a reasonably good analogy for what a unikernel is. It basically takes over the, uh, the machine that it's running on and it's, it's effectively running one application. Um, uh, so modern, uh, or another way to think about a unikernel is that it's like a stripped down operating system with just enough functionality to run a single application. And in fact, that's what a number of the implementations well, two of the implementations are, um, uh, and I'll get into that uh, later exactly how that works or which ones uh, do that. Um, I was having a chat with one of the other speakers a little earlier, and he said to me, well, what's the difference between a unikernel and an RTOS? And I sort of thought, well, actually, th there's a reasonable case there to argue that, that in many ways RTOS applications have a lot in common with unikernels. They're often... Uh, specifically configured to a particular set of hardware drivers and they often run only one uh, application. So, uh, so credit to Stefan for his insight there. Um, uh, the interesting thing about uh, unikernels and why, they, why they've really come about now and why they're significant at the moment um, is really because of uh, the, the virtual disk driver and the virtual network driver um, within the Zen uh, um, and also KVM, uh, virtualization systems. Zen and KVM really only implement um, one or maybe two uh, virtual network drivers or virtual disk drivers. And what that means is that operating systems no longer have to deal with the, uh, the age-old issue of there being an incredible number of drivers out there to support. So if you're going to build an operating system to run under the, the under um, as a guest operating system in Zen, then you only really need to support the virtual um, device drivers provided by Zen. And that is a whole lot easier to do than trying to support all of the hardware in the world, which is what traditional operating systems such as Linux and Windows need to do. Uh, the other thing about unikernels, uh, they're often uh, very small, sometimes only a few megabytes. Um, and startup times can be extremely low too. Sometimes it's only a matter of milliseconds for the um, unikernel to be fully up and running. Uh, many of the, the uh, unikernels that are common today um, are, are, are language specific. And what that means is that you need to, if you're gonna use the unikernel or if you wanna deploy the unikernel, you need to write your code in the language that the unikernel supports. Um, uh, quite why that's happened, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, that seems to be the way that uh, many of them work, and we'll, we'll have a look at them in a sec. Uh, um, so what code can you run on a unikernel? Because presumably, if, if you're interested in the idea of a unikernel, you'll start to think, well, I can't, what, can I, what can I run on it? Um, and what you can run on it really comes back to this question of, of of what language does the unikernel support. So maybe it makes sense for us to have a look. Uh, there we go, I'm forgetting to 
do my slides. Stefan will have to wave at me if I'm forgetting my slides. Um, so we can, what we can do is visit the, the unikernel zoo, which is to say that in 2016, um, there are many uh, unikernels out there and there seem to be many more turning up uh, all the time. Um, Mirageos, Rump, HalVM, Ling and more. Actually, just before we go on, one of the things I wanted to do but forgot to do when we started, I wanted to find out um, how many people here feel that, that they know quite a lot about unikernels already? Can you stick up your hand if you've kind of dug into it? Okay. Uh, and how many people kind of uh, know a bit about it and, and uh, feel like it's something they need to get onto their radar relatively soon? And how many people really know nothing about unikernels at this stage? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's most. <laughs> All right, good one. Well, this, this is a pretty basic presentation, so we're talking to the majority, I think, or well, hopefully it's basic. Um, so um, looking at some of the unikernels that are out there, Mirageos, um, Mirageos is, it, it seems to be the unikernel that... Um, uh, is one of the most mature implementations out there. Um, it, I, I believe it's one of the earliest, and it's certainly one of the ones that uh, um, has sort of garnered a lot of the attention in the unikernel field, if there is such a thing at the moment, because it's pretty small. Um, and it describes itself as a, a library operating system that constructs unikernels. Um, it was developed by a team of uh, people, many of whom work for uh, for a company in Cambridge, uh, UK, called Unikernel Systems. Um, Mirageos applications must be written in OCaml. So if you want to deploy a Mirageos Unikernel, you get, either you have to know OCaml or you're going to have to learn it. Uh, and I had a look at it, and I'm a lowly Python programmer, and it was, it was a bit hard for me. So um, I, I moved on to the next uh, Unikernel. Um, Interestingly, uh, Mirageos unikernels can now be run on uh, other unikernels, being the rump kernel, which we'll talk about in a sec, but I don't want to confuse you. Um, Docker uh, announced a couple of weeks ago that they've acquired unikernel systems. So they bought, I don't know, possibly the only uni unikernel company that's out there at the moment. Um, so they've acquired unikernel systems, uh, 14 people for an undisclosed sum. I, I presume, it didn't, they didn't really explain why, but I presume it's because um, uh, Unikernel Systems ran out of money. I don't know. Maybe it was an equa hire. They didn't seem to have any products, so uh, it's not really explained quite what the motivation was. But the motivation for Docker uh, appears to be uh, that Docker very much believed that Unikernels are, are significant for the future. How that's going to play out with... Um, the Docker ecosystem, it's hard to know. Although what I would say is that right now most unikernels are, can be launched via Docker. So maybe, I don't know. Uh, another unikernel is HalVM. Um, uh, HalVM, from their website, HalVM enables developers to write high-level, lightweight virtual machines that can run directly on the Zen hypervisor. And it's developed by, how we pronounce this, Galois? I don't know. A US company based in Portland, Oregon. Um, so this is another language specific uh, unikernel and you'll need to write your code in Haskell. Um, uh, any Haskell programmers here? One, two, three? <laughs> three, okay. So, um, if, uh, Uh, Microsoft, uh, not to be left out of the game, um, Microsoft have Drawbridge, which is um, from their website, uh, Drawbridge combines two core technologies. First, a PICO process, which is a process-based isolation container with a minimal kernel API surface. Secondly, a LibreOS, which is a version of Windows Enlightened to run efficiently within a PICO process. Did you get that? <laughs> I don't know. It's a research project. Um, and uh, as with a lot of Microsoft stuff, it's probably not likely to be the actual technology that becomes the Microsoft Unikernel, but you could be reasonably confident that um, 
that Microsoft won't be left out of this game, and we will probably see unikernel versions, I imagine, of SQL Server and many of the other main applications that they've got. Uh, but they haven't announced anything more than this research project at this stage. Uh, there's the Ling unikernel. Um, and I don't know what it is about unikernels, but it seems to attract uh, some of the less common languages. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the Ling unikernel, it bills itself as Erlang on Zen, Zen uh, and, and somewhat grandiosely at, at, the, at the heart of super elastic clouds. Um, and it's being built by Cloudoza Systems in, uh, in, in Israel. Um, and uh, of course, there are, there, uh, I think RabbitMQ is built with uh, Erlang. Are there any Erlang programmers here? Uh, same guy as who was doing the Haskell, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> no? Um, what was that? All right. Uh, well, I think RabbitMQ is, is built in, in Erlang and uh, Couchbase is also built in Erlang. They're the only ones that came to mind uh, for, for me. Um, but I guess this points the way to maybe there being unikernel implementations of um, uh, some of those uh, Erlang applications. Um, did I say Israel for Cloudos? Or I meant Russia. I think they're... I think they're in Russia. Apologize to the Cloudoza systems if anyone is watching this. Right. Next language-specific unikernel is, uh, is runtime.js. Um, this is the unikernel for JavaScript programmers. Um, uh, and um, uh, this is an open source project. It's built on Google's V8 uh, engine. Um, and so if you love JavaScript or hate it, uh, it's, it's here to stay, I think. Um, but look, uh, th this, this, look, this looks really interesting to me because I like JavaScript and I like programming in JavaScript. Um, and I think that given the vast uh, interest in Node.js as a back-end server, it's likely that this will probably get some legs um, uh, so that looks like an interesting one. I haven't given it a go or played with it yet, but it, I would like to get time to do so. Um, OSV is, is yet another uh, unikernel implementation. Uh, this is one of the, the two or three unikernel implementations that aren't language specific. These ones take a different approach, which is that the, um, they take an operating system uh, in this case, uh, uh, FreeBSD, uh, and then you, you, you strip the operating system down, you basically remove everything uh, except what's required to run an application. So you need, uh, you need uh, disk drivers and network drivers um, and some sort of standard library to, uh, to run the applications, uh, presumably. But the idea being that um, uh, the idea being that the, the operating system is so stripped down that there's really nothing left underneath. There's certainly no user system underneath. Um, and that means that there's, uh, there's no scope at all to do things like sign into it because everything is gone from the operating system except the absolute barest minimum. Um, OSV bills itself as, it's the only unikernel that I have noticed, and there may well be others, but not, uh, it's the only one that I've noticed. Um, that advertises that it executes JVM uh, applications and POSIX. Um, and this is being developed out of Israel. This is Cloudius Systems. Um, and and the, the, the final one that I'll give any sort of detail to is, is rump kernels. Has anyone heard of rump kernels? One, two, three, four. A small handful, okay. Well, the, this is the one that I gave most of my attention to, and this is the one that I, I've done the most research with and fiddling with and trying to work out how to, how to make it go. Um, rump kernels... Um, uh, 
Yeah, so rump, rump kernels are a similar thing to OSV in that it's an extremely stripped down uh, version of NetBSD in effect. Um, what I understand it to be, and again, I don't pretend to be uh, a deep expert, but what I understand it to be is uh, uh, essentially stripped down to a NetBSD kernel. It's using user space drivers, so the drivers for the network and the disk are executing in uh, user space. Um, and it provides standard libraries for compiled applications to work. Um, so you build a, a rump kernel by compiling your application um, and then baking it in with the rump kernel, which is their term for how you put together um, a, 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 a rump kernel, a rump unikernel. Um, and the, the, the output of, of any of these um, unikernels is a kernel that you can boot with grub, basically, in effect. Um, The, and there's a great deal of uh, interest in RUMP and a great deal going on in the RUMP space. The Mirage OS unikernel, which I mentioned earlier, um, and the HALVM unikernel are both, um, uh, as I under, well, uh, Mirage OS currently runs under the RUMP kernel, so you can run RUMP, uh, sorry, you can run Mirage OS unikernels inside the RUMP kernel. Um, and I believe that the same thing is happening with the HALVM um, uh, uh, Unikernel. Um, there's a packages directory for rump kernel, uh, and um, in there you can find rump kernel implementations of MySQL, Nginx, Redis, HAProxy, Node.js, and a bunch of other stuff. So the thing that um, uh, drew me to the rump kernel is that for the most part it will execute compiled POSIX applications. Um, uh, largely unmodified, but, uh, but it kind of depends on the application. And again, forgive me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the bit that, that, that uh, you can't do with these um, uh, rump kernels is you can't have forking processes. You can have threading but not forking. So for example, what that means in the case of Nginx, Nginx can be configured such that you turn off um, the forking. It doesn't fork out a whole bunch of other processes. It runs just as a single, uh, single process, but apart from that, um, it, uh, it, it's a, a fully working Nginx um, uh, web server. Um, and, and that uh, there's ev ever increasing interest in, in, uh, in, in the rump kernel. Um, and there's more. <laughs> there's, um, there's, there's ClickOS, there's Clive, there's ClueDOS. Um, and, uh, and who knows, there's probably others in, in development. Um, possibly a, a, a Linux-based unikernel um, uh, coming. I saw just a couple of days ago on Hacker News, there was a, a link to something called the LKL, the Linux Kernel Library. Um, uh, and the comments on the, the Hacker News post were suggesting that this may be the basis for a Linux-based uh, unikernel, but I haven't looked at that in any depth. Um, so that's a bit of an overview of, of what unikernels are um, and the kind of state of the, the industry, a state of play with what unikernels are, are out there. Um, uh, so to, <clears throat> to come back to the, the, the um, subject of the talk, unikernels and, and security. It's possible, it might happen one day that your boss might call you in and bail you up for connecting a Linux machine to the public internet. I'm presuming that most of you, you people have uh, Linux servers connected to the internet, or maybe many of them. Uh, and presumably, I, I, is there anybody here who is running a, a Linux server that doesn't have a user sign-in built into it? This gent up here, I'll be interested to hear how he's doing it later, and another one. So. Uh, what we can take from this is for the most part, most of the Linux machines that are on the internet can be signed into. Um, uh, I'm sorry to inflict Donald on you. <laughs> the good news is from the Iowa caucuses is that I don't think we're gonna have to put up with him too much longer. But <laughs> hopefully. Um, look, I don't, I don't think you're ever gonna get fired for connecting a, a a Linux machine to the public internet, but 
that, but the point that I'm trying to bring across is, is that um, I think that in the future, machines that have user sign-in capability will start to look like uh, a security risk. Uh, and, th and that's an idea that, that, that's, that's hard to unthink. Uh, computers that can be logged into shouldn't be connected to the public facing internet. So, so there's, no, there's, no, there's no door in a unikernel. The, the whole point is that um, Oh yes, <laughs> if I was on Reddit, I'd probably be downvoted to oblivion right now. This gent's got a question. Yes, sir. Oh yeah. I just appreciate a whole lot if you could define what you mean with log in. Uh, oh, there seems to be a purpose to running a server on the internet, right? And. Yes, uh, via SSH, typically you would use SSH to so connect to a machine, the... put in a username and password, and then you're, you are logged in. So uh, that's what I mean by a, 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 um, uh, a user sign-in system. Any machine, basically, in which people can log into it, have control over it, do stuff, change it, modify it, whatever. Um, that's what I'm suggesting, really, uh, probably... I think in the future there will be a great deal less of that on the internet. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. So would you consider moving files into the machine as part of being able to log in? Or are you talking about an immutable machine? That immutable is machines. These are typically immutable machines. There's a term for this that's used called immutable infrastructure. And what that effectively means is that uni the unikernel uh, is a, uh, it's a compiled bit of code. Um, and nothing changes in it, nothing can be changed in it. So login is not really that important. It's there's, just... there's no point that you don't need any sort of login because it's, it's fixed. If you want to make changes, then you would build a new unikernel and you would deploy that uh, completely new version. Okay. Now, I think there's a question over here as well. So that also means that you have a whole bunch of constraints around your application. You don't have file services, you don't have any um, threading or, 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 well, you've got threading, but, yeah, no, I'm just trying to understand. Okay. Okay. So you can get those services. Yeah, it is, it, it is true that there are, there are uh, some constraints and that most of the configuration happens up front for a unikernel prior to it being deployed and then kind of nothing changes once it's built. I do have a question. <laughs> sure, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So would you need a unikernel to make a system immutable? I don't think so. You could make even today's systems completely immutable. Sorry, would you mind re-asking the question? Yes. Uh, I don't believe you would need a unikernel to make a system immutable. No, no I don't think it's necessarily... Right, right. So, the, 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 so you're positioning unikernels as a way of achieving uh, an immutable system. It is one way it's of achieving It's just one them. way. Yeah, Existing right. Linux can also be configured. You could, yeah, yeah, that is. You exactly that semantic of not being able to change once it's deployed. Yeah, I don't have any experience in that, but I presume it is possible to configure a Linux system such that it's effectively immutable. Yeah. Boot from CD. Boot from CD. Just have a question at the back. So how is this different from a, a pre-built Linux system on a read-only file system running a single process and a single user with you know, SE Linux enforcing a whole bunch of uh, things there and still being able to use fork to do isolation between you know, connection handling things? How would that be different from a I think, completely... I think this gent just made a similar point. Uh, look, it's, it's a good question. And ultimately, kind of, 
at what point do you, do you say it's unikernel? Uh, the rump kernel is peeled away kind of layers of operating system until you end up with, uh, it was still NetBSD, but uh, there's just not much of it, not much of it left. Um, uh, and presumably, uh, yes, you could do a similar thing with Linux where you peel away enough. So, uh, yeah, so there's no real difference and I would just run Linux in a constrained environment on a VM. I, I would need to talk to you in more depth. I'm not sure how to answer, actually. I'd probably need to better understand what you've got in mind, I think. Yeah, you may be right. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, when we were running uh, DOS machines, um, yes. a DOS application, if it had a bug, could write to any memory in the machine. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't uncommon uh, when running DOS servers that the machine just suddenly reboot for no apparent re reason because of application crash. Uh -huh. uh, if you had a, a Linux system running at a single, with a single process, even if that process ran as root, it yep. couldn't do certain things. Mm -hmm. you, you could have the process crash, you could have the, the kernel crash easily, and there are obviously other ways. If you have a process running as non-root, then without a, a bug in the kernel, uh, you can't even crash the, the machine entirely. Um, how do you think this compares to, to uh, the, uh, the advantages of having this uh, process separation compares to the advantages of the, the uh, unikernel? I, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that I, I am able to give you an accurate answer but my, because I, I'm not sure that I know enough to be able to explain what the correct answer is. But what I would say is that uh, if you've got a Linux application at the moment, and presum presuming there was a, a Linux uh, unikernel, which there isn't really as yet, but presuming there was, then essentially um, it is largely the same as running a Linux application now. It's, it's, it would be running a stripped down kernel and a, and a minimal application and a minimal set of drivers. So the behavior is likely to be exactly the same as if it's running on a fully blown system I can't see that it would be that the, the fundamental of the behaviour of the system or how it relates to the memory would be uh, would be different. Does that make sense? In the start of your talk, you're comparing unikernels to a, a DOS machine. A uh, DOS it's a very could, broad analogy. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, you were saying that a benefit of it is that, that, that there's uh, no address-based transitions. So on, on Linux, if a process does a system call, you have to change the memory mapping uh, to uh, the kernel uh, mappings. Yeah. Kernel no, processing. my analogy didn't go to mem memory mapping. The, the analogy with DOS is really more to point out that in, in a unikernel, it's a single application. The machine is running a single application. Um, so, you know, same as DOS. The thing with DOS, of course, is that there were no limits. You had the entire memory space available and you could do whatever you want. My, the point was more... N n my point was not so much that unikernels give you access to the entire address space, but more that uh, a unikernel is a single application running on that machine. Does that make sense? So, so in that case, uh, uh, if you have a, a Linux machine configured with just a single application mm. uh, and have that Linux kernel running under Zen or something, that would meet uh, your criteria. Can you maybe yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't actually complete what I was going to say back here. Um, so one, one of the primary goals of hackers is to log into a target system. Um, and once a hacker has managed to get into a system, that's where things go really bad. Uh, and everyone here knows that once a hacker is inside a system, is it still going? Did it just stop? Oh, no. Um, uh, and everyone here knows that once a hacker is inside a system, uh, a great deal is at risk. Um, so the usual focus of security efforts is to prevent hackers getting in the front door, and that's done by implementing firewalls, complex passwords, 2FA, keys, certificates, intrusion detection systems, and, and other measures. Uh, but most of this goes away when the server um, uh, has no user layer at all uh, and, and simply cannot be signed into. Um, all that's running on the machine is the application code, as we've talked about, minimal kernel functionality, network and disk drivers, and nothing else. So you can't log into a system that doesn't have 
a login system function at all. Uh, if there's no user subsystem, no login prompt, uh, there's no way in and there's nothing to get into. Uh, so are, are unikernels uh, invulnerable uh, do, and do they solve all security problems? Do I still need a, a firewall? Um, no and no, of course, they're not invulnerable um, and they, they don't solve all security problems. One example of a case in which um, uh, they, they would still be vulnerable with one of the, the recent well-known security bugs was with um, Heartbleed, which gave the attacker access to the memory of the, um, the application. Um, and uh, a unikernel would be just as vulnerable to a protocol that is able to get access to the, to the memory. Uh, I think that a lot of the exploits on the internet, I'm not a, a security expert, but I think that a lot of the exploits on the internet are less of that characteristic of being able to directly access memory, and they tend to be around um, accessing other parts of uh, the, the software in a server. Um, Unikernels, they remain vulnerable to attacks on surrounding systems, distributed denial of service attacks, DNS attacks, uh, compromised cloud account logins, and any number of other attacks on related systems. So they're not a, you know, it's not, I, I, I don't want to present in any way that a unikernel is um, some sort of, you know, security heaven. But what it does do is that it reduces the attack surface and it takes away a lot of the concerns that there are um, and, and risks represented by people logging into it, um, into a system. And, and do you still need a firewall? I have heard it argued by, I think, some of the Mirage OS people that you don't need a firewall anymore, but I would run one. <laughs> I'd be a bit nervous without a firewall. Um, so just getting close to, to finishing for a bit of fun. Mirage OS have on the internet their Bitcoin pinata. Does everyone know what a piñata is? I'll tell you anyway. Um, a piñata is one of them, and they're typically at children's parties, and they get hung up by a string, and children hit, children hit them with a stick, and when they break open, all the lollies pour out, and the kids run in and grab them. Um, Mirajos, the guys there, have made a Bitcoin piñata, which is a unikernel uh, sitting on the internet um, that they invite people to try to crack, um, and if you crack it, then you will get a key, and the key you can use to claim the bitcoins. Um, and uh, the, I believe it's been up for quite a long time now. I think it's over a year. Uh, and no one's claimed any of the bitcoins yet. Um, and you, if you're interested in it, you can find it at ownme.ipredator.se. Um, and uh, so I think, that's, uh, I think that's really Mirajos wanting to make some statements about the security of, of unikernels. Are you convinced? <laughs> uh, computers that can be logged into shouldn't be connected to the public facing internet. Uh, I will have succeeded if, if at least I've got you thinking in, in this direction. Um, if, if you start to look at your servers that are connected to the internet and you think, hmm, user sign-in system could be, could be a risk, then I, I will have succeeded. Um, uh, so, so that's it. Uh, so following the many questions that we had, are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? Probably more in the lines of a comment than a question. Um, it seems to me that, that um, focusing so much on replacing the kernel as the thing to do to try and uh, help in this space is probably, at least at the moment, sort of misguided. The bigger problem we have is that most existing applications won't actually be interesting to run in a unikernel space because they don't have an API-based management plane. And so if you try to put most existing POSIX apps, for example, in an environment like this, the moment you take away the ability to go uh, manipulate a configuration file, you've lost most of the configuration and management interface to the app. So the, I think the bigger problem we've got is that we have to train the vast majority of people writing applications and writing management infrastructure to think in terms of if it hasn't got a programmable API 
other than go edit this config file that you just aren't done yet. Um, because that's the thing that will allow us to end up in a world, whether it's a Linux kernel just not, you know, on a machine not running an SSHD or some other kernel, you know, I guess it remains to be seen what will be more interesting. But until we get folks building the rest of the layers of infrastructure to think in terms of how you're going to manage and control things without having to have, uh, without needing to have what amounts to a login to the box, um, this becomes a really difficult problem to solve. And I wonder if that isn't part of the reason that most of the interest in this seems to be gang to folks who want to sort of completely change the way we think about programming anyway. Yeah, I, look, I think they're, I think they're, they're reasonable comments and that uh, appli some applications are well suited to running in a unikernel, some are not. Uh, and, I, and I think that uh, over time, developers will start to tune into whether or not what they're building is well suited to, to being built as a unikernel and some things just aren't and, and shouldn't be really, you know. Just in reply to that, um, just because you're running a unikernel doesn't mean you can use normal, you can't use normal file systems, et cetera. It's, uh, it's actually quite common when building a rump kernel to say, hook up the hypervisor calls for open, read, write to um, just a normal file system, but you might use something, um, you know, more cloudy such as like, you know, Ceph or, um, you know, some of the Amazon S3 or whatever the hell you want to use, um, because you don't have to map them to, you can map them to anything you want. Uh, and often, to run on different devices, you will just map, say, the open to a direct PCI device. So in the hypervisor, you, you know, you sort of use the, say, the file system baked into the rump kernel, and it just accesses the raw block device rather than going via the normal operating system's drivers. Yeah, it's 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 completely true that certainly in the case of the rump kernel, I don't know about the others, but. Um, they're, they're in no way constrained in terms of having a file system and accessing block devices and mounting stuff. How are we going for time? Just can I ask, have we got time for more questions? We've got a time for probably like one or two more questions. Okay. Um, two here. Any more questions, this gent here? Um, so my question is, how do you see this fitting in the whole Internet of Things kind of thing? Is this the way to go? Is this something that should we consider for that? I, I'm, I'm, I'm completely ignorant to the Internet of Things. I'm sorry, I haven't paid any attention to it. I, I don't know, but in terms of where will unikernels be in the, in the, in the future, my guess is that a lot of um, uh, organisations will have at least part of their production fleet running unikernels. I mean, look, when I write Python code, one of the things that I get really edgy about is running it on a server that could get hacked. I mean, you know, anything can get hacked. And you just think, you know, I would rather it, it, it was a whole lot harder for people to get in and, and touch the code or dig around, look for keys or whatever. So I, I suspect that in the future, unikernels will be a very big thing. It's just my guess. So have you looked at the density of properties of unikernels and performance attributes of unikernels? I thought that those were the big selling points for at Only, least cloud yeah, guys. So your question is, have, have, have I looked at the performance or has anyone else the looked at the performance? The one? The density aspect, how many can you pack? How many applications can you pack? Oh, the density, I, I don't have an answer to that. I presume exactly the same as any other operating system. How many unikernels could you run on a machine? How many VMs can you run? On a machine, that's that's. Uh, it should be exactly the same as um, all the other, um, uh, you know, VM implementations out there. Just because it's running as a unit kernel doesn't. I, from what I've seen, it doesn't dramatically affect performance this way or that. Maybe ten percent up or down. Hmm. Any other questions? All right. Uh, thanks for uh, listening. Thanks, Andrew.